India's native country in 2004. He worked for two years as a resident veterinarian for the veterinary teaching hospital at the University of Zimbabwe, attending all animal species in a mixed practice setup. Following an internship at the University of Missouri and a residency at the University of California, Davis, he became board certified in large animal medicine with the American College of Veterinary Internal Medicine in 2010. Dr. Mavangira was an assistant clinical professor at Tuskegee University before joining Michigan State University as a clinical instructor in large animal medicine. Dr. Mavangira also continued his education at Michigan State University and earned his PhD in comparative medicine and integrative biology. Dr. Mavingra's research interests are on oxidative stress during inflammatory conditions. He is currently evaluating treatment options for acute clinical mastitis caused by gram-negative bacteria in dairy cattle. So with this, I request Dr. Wangai to deliver his lecture. Over to Dr. Wangai, please. Okay, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm really grateful for this opportunity to participate in this webinar series. Uh, my, my talk is rather broad, um, and really there's no way to cover all that is relevant under this topic. However, the content that will be discussed here was specifically selected from uh, in my initial communications uh, through the invite to, to present this lecture. So most of the conditions that I will present to you today uh, have to do with the ruminant four stomachs, which probably is one of the biggest systems that we're going to be are going to be commonly uh, that is going to be commonly affected in diseases of uh, of cattle. Uh, this talk is particularly geared towards uh, clinical veterinary students, um, pre-veterinary students, and for practitioners out there and academicians, uh, probably this is going to be um, a refresher or just an overview or a review of things that you already know, that you already do, and your experiences will be valuable if you are able to share. So with that my talk today here is the overview. So I will briefly discuss uh, general diagnostic assessment in a ruminant. Just looking at those things that I would consider perhaps minimum uh, that are required for us to reach a definitive diagnosis uh, in a presenting patient. And then I will go into specific conditions basically the ones that are listed in, uh, on this slide. So I'll talk about blood. And I have in here vagal indigestion. And this is sort of a historical classification of the conditions I'll be talking about. Um, and it's important to cover this because they are important differential diagnosis uh, to blood. And then we'll talk about rumen, rumen acidosis and then finally abomeso displacement and then we'll get into our question and answer segment for our discussion. Okay, so one of the main challenges when it comes to diseases that affect ruminants and perhaps just farm animals in general uh, is the fact that um, cost really is an issue, right? We are really limited in terms of how much, in, how many diagnostics we can perform uh, usually we're working with a very tight budget and within that tight budget, we have to do the absolute best we can to arrive at a definitive diagnosis. So the basic things you would need are obviously restraint, right? Uh, for the safety of the examiner and the, the safety of the animal. Your basic tools would obviously be a stethoscope, thermometer. Uh, you may have other tools with you as well, a flashlight, for example. If you're going to examine the oral cavity, if, it's, if, if that is indicated, but also examining the, the eyes, for example. Um, other things that you should do, in my mind, that should constitute um, part of a complete physical exam would be, for instance, if it's a dairy cow, uh, definitely you have to access uh, the milk. 
you have to examine the milk as well because we know one of the main conditions affecting dairy cattle is mastitis. So that has to be part of your routine physical uh, examination. And obviously, this is assuming that the animal you are examining is a lactating dairy cow, right? The other thing you have to try and do is collect a urine sample and evaluate it um, as part of your physical exam because this will yield uh, useful information. So again, going back to your dairy cow, if she is recently fresh, that is just calved, most of them, they experience to some degree a level of ketosis that you can pick up on examining uh, a urine sample. And that this is a very, fairly easy procedure to do. And then it is absolutely necessary. If you're examining a cow or any or a bovine species for any clinical disease to be able to perform a rectal exam, I always um, say to students that if you are able to fit your hand into the rectum of the bovine species you're working on, then you should absolutely do it if it is uh, clinically indicated. Then they are, you know, there's a whole list of ancillary diagnostics that you can use. So one of the common comments that usually students will give is that, you know, these are farm animals. We're already limited in terms of money. How much, how many more diagnostics can we perform? But it is important to just keep in mind that these ancillary diagnostics are available and you can specifically choose one that may give you the most important uh, information to add on to your physical examination that you have already thoroughly performed. Um, and if money is a limitation, let that be the reason, but rather than prematurely determining that because it's a farm animal, you may not be able to use any one of these ancillary diagnostics. So these would be diagnostics that we're already familiar with in other species, uh, particularly small animals. So blood work, chemistry, uh, CBC, in-depth urinalysis, so other than the dipstick you have performed, you can do other things as well. Imaging is really important. Um, as you probably remember from the previous uh, lecture uh, covering ultrasonography, I would suspect that there were several conditions in which ultrasonography is particularly useful uh, in, in examining the ruminants. And then, then any other uh, assessments that you can do in combination to those imaging techniques. So. Here I'm talking about ultrasound guided collection of samples that can then be sent to uh, for further analysis in the laboratory. And there's any number of uh, contrast imaging modalities that can also be performed. Endoscopy is also another. So by no means is this information on this slide exhaustive um, and the availability of these tests, um, location and cost are going to determine what is going to be uh, practically available in a, in a given situation. So going into the disorders of the four stomachs, I always like to start by reminding myself uh, what I consider pertinent uh, information that describes what should be normal, right? So what I would expect a normally functioning um, set of four stomachs would have to perform, be able to perform the following functions, right? It should be appropriate um, uh, feed intake, ingestion, chewing, and this induces saliva production, which is very important. Saliva is rich in bicarbonate and phosphates, and we know that this is important for buffering um, capacity in the rumen. Then the rumen contractions that we're, we are supposed to pick up or examine for in our physical examination, and we know these are important for mixing feed and aid in digestion, um, also the process of eructation um, and the process of rechewing the cud. And obviously the coordinated movements are important for moving ingesta in an um, upward direction. So further into the omesum, abomesum and small intestines and so forth. And then we know the rumen, the four stomachs are a site of absorption for several um, materials, including electrolytes, magnesium and phosphorus are just a a few examples. Um, back for normal rumen contractions, basically we talk about two sets, right? There's a primary contraction which originates in the reticulum. 
and this is uh, described as being biphasic. So we have two constructions, then a secondary construction will follow. The, mix, the primary contractions are primarily responsible for the mixing activity, and then the secondary contraction is really important for eructation purposes. And so it comes down to about one to three contractions that you may be able to pick up when you examine over um, the two-minute period. So what are those things that cause excitation or stimulate contractions of the rumen, okay? These are important things. As, as you are examining the animal, you have to keep in mind some of those differentials and those and how they can affect the activity of the rumen. So when we're looking at excitation, we're thinking about what processes actually stimulate rumen contraction, and one of them is just moderate uh, feeling of the rumen. So the process of feeding moderately fuels the rumen, and that should stimulate low threshold tension receptors to induce uh, contraction. The process of it's eating itself um, stimulates the buccal receptors in the mouth, and that should stimulate contractions. Um, increased acidity in the abomasum is also supposed to increase um, contractions. And then we also have to consider those things that will inhibit ruminal contractions because this may indicate some of the systemic conditions that we have to pay attention to and have to think about in terms of focusing our diagnostic capability so we reach a definitive diagnosis. So one of those things that will inhibit uh, contraction would be the distension high tension receptors, so in a room and that's overly filled. So this is just a little bit more than the moderate feeling that we talked about. And then there are tension receptors in the abomasum. So in instances where the abomasum becomes overfilled, there's going to be uh, reflex feedback that is going to stop contractions so that uh, continual filling of the abomasum is, um, is stopped. Then we, we talk about volatile fatty acids too, uh, and particular diseases such as rumen acidosis, where they become or stay in undissociated forms, they can also inhibit contractions. And in situations where we have really low pH, less than 5.0 in the, in the rumen, that is also inhibitory to contractions. And then anything that induces fear uh, and pain is also expected to reduce contractions of, uh, of the four stomachs. Um, a few more things to think about. Uh, in cases of systemic diseases where the central nervous system is affected, there's definitely depression of the gastric centers. This is where um, the turn of the vagus nerve is initiated. We know that the vagus nerve is the major um, innovation to the four stomachs and is responsible for motility. Those things that are, cause that are going to cause depression of the gastric centers would include things like anesthesia, uh, systemic diseases with endotoxemia, fever, uh, low blood pH, and some electrolyte abnormalities. And then there may be toxins as well uh, that act locally within the room and just like volatile fatty acids. Um, and this can all be classified or lumped up under uh, products of abnormal fermentation. Uh, there's a Defective vagal innervation, which historically I did mention that the vagal indigestion has been used to classify different conditions affecting the four stomachs. But uh, as we we'll, uh, mention later, uh, in naturally occurring conditions of affecting four stomachs, there's not really a clear demonstration of pathology of the vagus nerve in itself per se most of the naturally occurring conditions actually do not have that as a, as, a, as a pathological finding. Then there are other conditions like hypocalcemia, which are commonly encountered in dairy cattle. So those are, because calcium is important for muscle contraction, obviously, uh, that can reduce motility of the four stomachs if, if it's deficient or decreased. And then finally, we're looking at some of those things that will affect the secondary contraction, and remember the secondary contraction is really important for eructation uh, to release some of that gas that is building up uh, during the process of microbial fermentation. Um, and then those things that are going to 
prevent that secondary contraction would include anything that covers the cardia. So the cardia would be the op- obviously the opening into the first compartment, the ruminal reticulum. Um, we're talking about instances where there is overfilling with ingester or, or fluid. And then if there's also gross over distension of, of, uh, of the rumen, so if you remember those high tension receptors that are responsible for, uh, for inhibiting uh, motility. I have this link here at the end. I will provide the, this uh, set of slides if you're able to access this link. If this link um, is from uh, North Carolina State University and it covers very nicely um, the physiology of rumen contraction. I really find it very, it's a very nicely animated and it will represent all the normal functions of the, of the full stomach. So if you are able to access it, um, I would highly encourage it. All right, so the first condition we'll look at uh, is blot and we'll follow up with the important differential differentials uh, to, this, to this condition. So here I just have a schematic uh, presentation of a cow here. And the first type of blot that we're looking at is free gas blot. And again, I just want you to remember that the vagal indigestion part is mostly for historical classification purposes. So this type of gas blot is actually sometimes considered under type 1 vagal indigestion. So in, te- in free gas blots, generally there is prevention of eructation. So something is inhibited the, is inhibiting the process of eructation. So ruminants are known to have the capacity to expel the gas that they, they are producing very efficiently. And this is despite situations where there might be overproduction, uh, frankly. So that means we have to be looking for um, those things that may obstruct the pathway to eructation. So this is representing the, the rumen and uh, any anything that is going to obstruct the esophagus all the way to the to the to the oral cavity would be responsible for free gas blood. So things like uh, anything anything that can get stuck or lodged in the in the esophagus, particularly the area of the pharynx or the the thoracic inlet. Uh, things like pharyngeal abscesses. Uh, sometimes it's possible that uh, cows can experience or cattle can experience. Uh, injuries um, during procedures that are common whenever we're using things like a bowling gun, for example, uh, that might result in development of abscesses and abscesses because of a mass effect can impinge on the esophagus and that can lead into the development of, of blood. And going further down to other parts, there might be things like masses that can cause obstruction at the level of the cardia, so things like uh, papillomas have been found before and lymphomas have been uh, described. Then actinomycosis, which is commonly uh, recognized in terms of causing uh, lumpy jaw. Uh, it's not unusual sometimes that, you know, cases may actually okay the level of the cardia. And so is actinobacillosis, which is um, a, con- a condition that we most commonly think of causing wooden tongue disease. Okay. And then if we look along the course, there are also lymph nodes that can become enlarged uh, during the processes of inflammation. So if any, in case of any inflammatory conditions that occur resulting in enlargement of the submandibular lymph nodes, they can be obstruction at this level. Animals that are experiencing pneumonia, um, they can result in uh, enlargement of mediastinal lymph nodes, and these can have a mass compressive effect on the esophagus and then an animal presents with uh, with a condition of blood. There are some other uh, conditions that we have to think about. So systemic conditions that I talked about that may affect motility in various ways, particularly depressing the the central nervous system, the gastric centers, or generally affecting the process of muscle contraction in itself. So examples would include tetanus, um, hypocalcemia, and neurological conditions or the, the administration of anesthesia, or anything that can cause toxic injury to the rumen. So as we'll see later on, um, one of the conditions, brain acidosis, for example, 
is associated with caustic injury to the rumen. And most of the time, these animals, perhaps in chronic situations, may present with recurrent uh, or prolonged uh, cases of blood uh, due to injuries that would have come occurred to the rumen or, or during acute cases of grain overload. Uh, this the same thing can also happen with the infection of the rumen wall with bacteria uh, and fungi. And spoiled or moldy feeds, uh, this can be responsible for accumulation of those toxic substances that may have inhibitory effects um, on the uh, on the contraction of, of the stomach for stomachs. And so all of these secondary conditions or systemic conditions uh, can be responsible for affecting or preventing the process of eructation and therefore resulting blood. Um, before we go on to the diagnostics for this condition, here's another common also type of broth, blood that can occur, which is frothy blood. And basically this is um, this comes about when there's increased gas production from highly fermentable carbohydrates. Uh, usually the feed stops being and products coming from the from these uh, proteins can result in coating of the gas bubbles that are full with the effect that the, the gas bubbles really remain as small uh, bubbles that do not coalesce into one bigger uh, gas bubble that can elicit uh, the process of eructation, right? This can um, elicit eructation by stimulating those uh, moderate uh, distension receptors in the rumen. And it is also important to note that froth has the same effect of fluid or increased amount of ingester at the level of the cardia. So this is how this is going to obstruct, obstruct the, the process of eruption. Okay, clinically, these animals will present uh, sometimes very, uh, you know, with a peracute death um, and or they can present with abnormally distended abdomen, particularly high on the left side, which is described as, you know, rumen tympani sometimes. And in terms of achieving a diagnosis, if it just if it is just free gas blood, passing a stomach tube should be able to relieve the gas uh, immediately. If there are any obstructing um, materials along the course of the esophagus, usually passing a stomach tube is also able to identify um, both identify the site of obstruction at least. And so, this is where again just passing a stomach tube, clinical presentation, and uh, using historical information as well may be adequate to arrive at a diagnosis for this animal. But you can also use some ancillary diagnostics, right? So after stabilizing the acute presentation in this animal, uh, you may be able to, to perform some other uh, diagnostic procedures such as endoscopy, for example, depending on availability. And that will be able you may be able to see exactly um, the specific process causing the obstruction. So here I'm thinking of if there's pharyngeal trauma, you'll be able to see and assess the degree of, uh, of damage or, or pathology going on. Uh, differentials to this condition would obviously include, um, so for free gas blood, obviously frothy blood would be a differential, but also those are the conditions that result in other classifications of vagal indigestion, which we will talk about here in the next few slides. Uh, for treatment, basically passing a stomach tube should, should work to relieve gas, but uh, as long as the offending materials are still within the, the rumen, this gas accumulation is expected to, uh, to reoccur. Uh, if, it's, um, if it's any any kind of obstruction in the course of the of the esophagus, then particularly identifying the site as well as what is causing the obstruction would be key, so that the addre addressing directly the the problem that's causing the obstruction would relieve the the occurrence of uh, of blood. A Kingman tube is basically just a large ball tube that can be used to evacuate the rumen contents. You can um, lavage with fluid or with water to remove some of the offending materials if possible. In cases of frothy blood, like I said, uh, the 
gas are just in presence of bubbles that are not coalescing to induce irritation, this may be difficult to even free using a large bore stomach tube. So in this case, we can utilize surface tension reducing agents. So some of us will remember poloxalin is one of the um, main, uh, main compounds that can be used. And the dose for treatment is basically two ounces or 60 ml uh, intraruminally. This is usually uh, mixed in a small volume of water, right? So up to about 500 ml or a liter, for example. Uh, if poloxalin is not available, this would definitely be your first choice. But if it's not available, some you could use laundry detergent as well. This may have problems, obviously, with um, accumulation of residues um, in animals that are going to be used for food production. Mineral oil or vegetable oil, if available, this can be, it probably will be the, the cheapest form of material that's available that can be used uh, as a surface tension reducing product. Uh, it is important to take care when using mineral oil to make sure that the, the stomach tube that is being used to administer this is really in the right place because this can cause aspiration pneumonia and it's really difficult to, to manage cases of aspiration pneumonia caused by mineral oil. Usually these animals will require retreatment after about 12 hours if medical management is all that is being used. Uh, in animals that may present in emergency situation. So we're talking of animals that probably are in respiratory distress because of over distension of uh, four stomachs affecting the function of the diaphragm and compressing on the lungs. Emergency trocarization should then be attempted. So this is assuming that passing the tube was your first choice, it didn't work. Then emergency trocarization should be performed and after the animal has been uh, stabilized, then you can perform a, com uh, a ruminotomy to completely empty the rumen or at least remove substantial amounts of the offending, offending uh, material in the rumen. So this is how I've, I visualize the surface, reduce, surface tension reducing agents working. Okay, this is just a schematic of the little bubbles of frothy blood that after addition of uh, poloxalin or theroblot should form this giant gas bubble which stimulates the moderate uh, distension receptors that then induce the process of eructation. Okay. Here's just a, a depiction of a, an animal that was uh, experiencing a blot and here's a, an example of a chemian tube and you can appreciate the amounts of um, ingested that we were able to siphon and also pump some fluid to basically evacuate some of the offending material. Right, here's a situation in which um, a trocar can be used and there are various forms that are available. Usually you want one that can be self-retaining and this is just for immediate stabilization of the patient before a more definitive uh, procedure can be performed and usually a um, ruminotomy. Whenever this pr procedure is performed, the client has to be informed about the serious uh, consequence of possibly this animal developing peritonitis. And this procedure necessitates that, you know, the use of uh, prophylactic antibiotics be administered as well. So this was a case that, you know, all, really at the verge of uh, respiratory distress and actually on attempting to pass a stomach tube in this cow, uh, the cow would immediately go into respiratory distress. And so this procedure was formed and this was just a few minutes later and you can appreciate um, how well uh, this procedure worked. When a ruminotomy is performed, uh, the surgical approach is basically uh, targeting the dorsal sac and um, opening the, the, the room and, and then evacuating the contents. And then we can replace with normal contents from a donor cow. Um, yeah. Surgical approach is the same as performing uh, an abdominal surgery in a cow for purposes of uh, exploration or, or fixing of uh, any other conditions that may be going on uh, using the left, paralum, uh, the left paralumbar approach in this case. Uh, <clears throat> 
in cases where ruminotomy is uh, decided on, again, this is this is mostly in emergency cases. And again, like I said, the most important thing to do initially is to stabilize the the patient and make sure to use prophylactic antibiotics um, for this particular patient. For prevention, it is key to avoid sudden dietary changes because usually this is what the presentation, um, the history upon presentation, um, you may be presented with this kind of history of perhaps sudden turnout on pasture and uh, an hour to a few hours later finding animals that are experiencing uh, bloat. When animals are going to be grazing on large pastures, it may be important to limit uh, turnout so that they get acclimated, or you may have to use uh, some of these agents that can be used to prevent proactively uh, possible cases of blood. So you can use proloxalin, for example, uh, that surface tension uh, reducing agent we, we spoke about earlier. And this can be top dressed on the feed, for example. It's also been reported that the use of ionophores, so most of you may recall uh, monensin, for example, uh, these have also been used to control or to manage uh, cases of, uh, or to prevent cases of blood. And again, I can't stress this enough, just as much as it is to, important to slowly introduce animals to lush pasture, it is a, the same approach as well when supplementing grain, that there has to be a slow acclimation or adaptation phase that should be, that should be observed. Okay, so that was um, blood, so both free gas blood and frothy blood. Now we'll talk about the type 2 vagal indigestion, which basically has to do with failure of omeso transport. And I have on this schematic here, the green portion is representing the reticular rumen, and this is the omesum. And the omeso transport failure is affecting two parts. <clears throat> so first, the reticular omeso orifice, as well as the omeso abomeso orifice. So where ingester moves from the omesum into the into the abomesum. And generally, we think about this condition as arising because of damage or affected function of the ventral branch of the vagus nerve because the ventral branch is responsible for innervating the, the reticulum, the omesum, and parts of the, of, of the abomesum. So omesal transport failure, basically what happens is that there's progressive distension of the rumen, and these animals tend to present with sort of a, what is characteristically described as a purple shape. So on the left side, there's a distension on the on the high level of the left side of the of the of the abdomen, and this is the apple type side, and then the ventral sac of the rumen sort of becomes enlarged and encroaches onto the right side, and that is the pear side of the purple. When you perform a rectal exam, you may be able to appreciate the sort of L shape of the rumen. Okay, as you feel the In to the side. And this case is, like I mentioned earlier, will be presenting with blood, but this is a slowly progressive condition. And it is important then to start to think about what might be the primary cause of this blood, which is really a secondary sign of, uh, of the condition that is happening. So this is where the diagnostic challenge really comes in, because depending on the primary underlying problem, there's a whole plethora of ancillary diagnostics that you can reach for in terms of figuring out exactly what may be causing the underlying problem. Okay, um, in terms of clinical presentation, uh, these cases can present with uh, hypermotility. Um, I would say that in my experience, most commonly, these animals present with reduced uh, motility. So perhaps the hypermotility was earlier on um, in the, if the injury was to the vagus nerve, there might be like increased excitation to the vagus nerve and therefore 
that may possibly explain the hypermotility that may be seen earlier in earlier in earlier stages of the condition. Because of decreased um, downward movement of ingester, there may be decreased manure. So this you are able to appreciate on rectal exam. Um, if you're able to obtain some manure, these usually have large fiber, which is an indication of uh, decreased or affected uh, digestion. And these animals will usually also present with significant dehydration. And this is largely because of ingester that is pulling in the room and acting as um, as osmolites essentially to pull fluid into the room and so basically there is accumulation of fluid within the room and but this animal is presenting with systemic dehydration because we know that the four stomachs are poor sites of water absorption so what are some of the causes of omeso transport failure um, the historical classification of vagal indigestion was largely, it came about because uh, earlier studies showed that if you could say if this ventral branch of the vagus nerve was sectioned, there was reproduction of some of the clinical signs uh, of this condition. But like I said, in naturally occurring cases of vagal indigestion, it is seldom uh, demonstrated that there's actually pathology of the vagus nerve. One of the main things that we know to to have to be uh, the most common cause of omeso transport failure are reticular adhesions that develop, and we'll talk about uh, hardware disease a little bit later. That would be one of the most common causes of uh, of reticular adhesions because of um, localized peritonitis. Um, and so that occurs in traumatic reticular pericarditis, otherwise known as, as hardware disease. Um, there are other conditions that have been associated with omesotransport failure, and this would include you know, peritonitis or hepatic abscesses. Um, we talked about papillomas at, at the reticular omeso orifice, and this obviously would present as like obstructive, uh, of obstructive lesions uh, that prevent that omeso um, or meso transport of ingester. Sometimes ruminants can ingest foreign bodies as well, so it's not uncommon that um, upon upon performing a luminotomy, it is possible that we may find some foreign bodies in there that may end up causing obstruction of ingester flowing into the omesome. The next type of vagal indigestion, again, that will result in animals presenting with uh, clinical signs of blot is the type three vagal indigestion. Again, more functionally categorized as a failure of pyloric outflow or pyloric outflow obstruction. Basically, the initial finding is that on examining the rumen, the ruminal activity is initially normal, uh, but because of outflow obstruction, the abomesum is going to become distended. And remember, we talked about tension receptors in the abomesum being responsible for reflexly inhibiting motility of the rumen. So this is what happens. Initial motility is normal, but later on as distension uh, continues, you may have an animal presenting with uh, decreased motility or atony of the, of the four stomachs. Um, <clears throat> As a consequence of accumulating material in the abomesum, there may be reflux of ingester into the reticular rumen compartment. And this is what is uh, characteristically referred to as internal vomiting in ruminants. Okay? When you perform a rectal exam, uh, just like in, in type 2 vagal indigestion, you get a sense of an overfilled uh, dorsal sac of the rumen and and also an overfilled ventral sac, and so you get to appreciate the L-shaped nature of the distended rumen. If you're able to perform uh, some of the ancillary diagnostics, for example, in this case, it will be particularly useful to be able to perform a rumen chloride test. Um, usually in these cases, because of the internal vomiting, the chloride concentrations can rise above 30 milliequivalents per liter, and that will be diagnostic of internal vomiting. And so that should lead to suspicions of pyloric outflow. And it's important to note at this point that despite the 
somewhat similar appearance between type 2 and type 3 vagal indigestion, this can often be a differentiating factor. So you don't have internal vomiting with type 2, which is the omesotranspate failure, but you do have that with type 3 vagal indigestion. Usually these animals can present with, uh, with their advanced cases. They may have significant abnormalities in terms of their serum chemistry if you're able to perform this. So usually they have hypochloremia and metabolic alkalosis. And I have to mention that the hypochloremic metabolic acidosis, al alkalosis, excuse me, um, tends to be a common finding, particularly in animals that are systemically sick for a long time, and in particular if they have disease of the GI tract, okay? But it, this hypochloremia and alkalosis tends to be really pronounced when there's outflow obstruction of the, alpha, of the albumism. You obviously see fecal, uh, decreased fecal output for obvious reasons. And here are some of the causes that you would have to think about for pyloric outflow obstruction. So things like abomesovolvulus, we'll talk a little bit about abomeso distension, displacement, and volvulus a little later. Um, abomeso displacement uh, either to the left or the right, and sometimes there can be development of ulcers as well, right, because of the abomeso displacement. And this can in turn result in pathology such that you end up with outflow obstruction and damage to, to the vagus nerve. Inflammation of the abomasum as well as the reticulum. So we'll talk about uh, hardware disease. Usually that would be the major cause of uh, inflammation around the reticulum. And then in places where you see BOV or bovine leukemia infection in cattle, such as here in the United States, it's not uncommon that we can find pyloric lymphosarcoma. And so this will have an obstruct, obstructive effect at the level of the pylorus, and we have animals presenting with type 3 vagal indigestion. Another common uh, differential to think about, and this is usually classified as a type 4 indigestion, but more functionally, this is classified as indigestion of late pregnancy because advanced pregnancy sort of induces uh, some kind of uh, partial obstruction to abomasal outflow. Uh, so this is always important to consider, and particularly uh, examining an animal that is in advanced uh, pregnancy. Now, because of all this uh, dysfunction of the four stomachs, animals that have been sick for a long time can present with weight loss as well. All right, so I usually have this as a, as a question for, for students, but I'll provide the answers as I go here. And so this was a case we saw earlier that was treated with an emergency trocarization to relieve the blood or the distension. And so the question was, what type of vagal indigestion would you be thinking about in this case? And so as we can appreciate the large distension we can see here, um, as well as distension on the left side, on the right side, a little bit lower. It will be key, it will be important to consider type two, type three, and type four. Of course, type four you'll be able to rule out now based on rectal exam or reproductive status on, of the animal. And then a little bit of information provided here, saying if this cow is coming from a group of cattle, maybe about 200 cows in the same pen and it is really absolutely the only animal that is affected, um, what would be your diagnostic approach in this case in terms of uh, narrowing down to what type of vagal indigestion may be occurring? So as a single animal from a group, it probably excludes uh, a common source, um, right? So they expect more animals to be affected if this was diet-related because they would have the same um, type of feed delivered to, to them, assuming that they are in a free store type setting. And so you do consider type 2 and type 3 reared to be um, most likely. And if you're able to run that rumen chloride, that will distinguish between type 2 and type 3, um, where type 3 is associated with that rumen chloride of greater than 30 milli equivalents per liter. And so that is the laboratory test you, you can run in this situation to try and narrow this down. Now, just to say that 
you know, if the rumen chloride is is normal, uh, chances that it's really truly type two, but it also be in the early stages of type three as well. So, yeah, this may not be truly truly differentiating between type two uh, and type three unless if this animal has really been chronically sick. And I always try to come up with a diagrammatic depiction to illustrate uh, how these animals are going to present uh, with different types of vagal indigestion. And it's really remarkable that, you know, if you're able to recognize this change in contour, just the shape of the four stomachs, where in type 1 indigestion, which is basically the free gas and the frothy blood that we talked about, distension is primarily limited to that left side. Um, and then type two and type three, you have the distension on both sides with uh, with that L-shaped appreciation of the rumen based on uh, on rectal examination. And so then uh, that sort of helps you in terms of the list of differentials that you have to consider. And as we'll see, some of the um, when we consider some of the ancillary diagnostics that you should consider for hardware disease. Um, I'll provide some detail here on how or how just appreciating the contour of the four stomachs is actually very well associated with uh, reaching your diagnosis of, uh, of, of hardware disease. And I'll explain that in a little bit when we get there. And again, so here, type 3, they're going to just in basically the same contour like we saw for type 2 here. Okay. And then type 4 with uh, just uh, basically bilateral ventral distension uh, in cases of um, pyloric outflow obstruction due to late pregnancy. But there are other things as well, right, that can cause diffuse distension that I've provided here. So animals presenting with high drops or hypocalcemia or those with systemic uh, conditions that are affecting motility in general, uh, peritonitis, septicemia, and enteritis, they can present with such a contour as well when viewing from behind. So that was the other types of vagal indigestion is uh, we think of as differentials to blot. Uh, now, a specific cause of blot in general that we should, I think that is really important to address here is the occurrence of rumen acidosis. Um, in this case, probably the more, the best way to characterize this is lactic acidosis because this is the main issue that's happening. There's overproduction of lactic acid within the rumen and there will be additional lactic acid pro production as well from peripheral tissues because these animals become really, really dehydrated and because of decreased perfusion, that can also add on to the amount of lactic acidosis that you will find systemically. So this is one of the most dramatic of uh, fermentative disorders in ruminants, right? And it develops in, in, in cattle mostly a long time ago um, when animals used to be component fed. So if they were provided grain uh, individually or separately, then that you would tend to see more cases then. But recently, because most of the diets are TMR best, there's a uh, good mixing, better mixing. That's not to say that you don't see these cases as well because things like mixing errors, for example, may be able to induce cases of, uh, of grain acidosis. Accidental exposures to cereal grains. This is probably one of the most common um, pieces of information you get on history taking. And then other feeds too that are highly digestible that have been ingested would include things like apples, uh, sugar beets and potatoes, so it's not only limited to to cereal grains. So, and if you, if the problem is affecting uh, grouped animals, uh, then you have to consider a common source um, as opposed to uh, an individual animal that is or, or otherwise separated. So, how does this develop? Basically, here I have uh, the changes in rumen pH that happen as rumen acidosis is developing. The color scheme is just basically to demonstrate the changes in the pH with green being um, towards normal, which is towards um, alkal alkaline line pH, and then uh, reddish as the pH drops down. So initially when uh, highly fermentable carbohydrates are ingested, 
they have rapid fermentation and accumulation of volatile fatty acids. And this is responsible for the initial drop in pH, right? So pH level of about 6.0, um, the volatile fatty acids can then become absorbed. Um, and then there is increased proliferation of Streptococcus bovis. And Streptococcus bovis is known to really produce a lot more acid. And so that affects, that makes this condition even uh, become worse. Now, with increasing acidity, gram-negative bacteria will start to die because this cannot, uh, cannot survive the acidic conditions. And as they do so, they can release the endotoxin, which is part of their, um, of their cell wall, and that can then re induce signs of endotoxemia systemically. Well, further production of lactic acid occurs from Streptococcus bovis, but the pH is going to reduce to such a level that even the Streptococcus bovis will start to die. And bacteria that particularly um, can utilize and thrive within a lactic acid environment, such as lactobacillus, will start to proliferate and result in further lactic acid production. And so that will even decrease the remain pH even further. And so the increased acidity may then induce a corrosive effect on the rumen epithelium and therefore, you know, lead to all the other sequelae that follow rumen acidosis. So you may have fungal or bacterial colonization of the rumen wall after injuries occurred to the rumen epithelium. So in terms of clinical findings and how these can be explained, so we talked about these animals presenting with, uh, with blood because uh, basically highly fermentable carbohydrates are resulting in excessive production of gas. Um, there's also production of the lactic acid, which basically act as, a, as an osmolite. So there's a lot of pulling of fluid into the rumen, and so this can result in uh, distension and obviously leading to systemic dehydration and in severe cases because of sequestering of fluid can result of uh, can result in hypovolemia. Uh, when you examine you perform a ballotment or succussion you can hear significant uh, splashy fluid sounds in the rumen and then these animals usually will present with uh, some level of depression, uh, injected sclera, and this is because of systemic signs that are being induced by endotoxemia. And then most often these animals can also present with diarrhea, right? And it makes sense because there's increased pulling of fluid within the, within the GI system. And just to rem make sure that I stress this point that rumen acidosis is usually an emergency and usually animals may may present and they may die quickly. And this really requires that emergency procedures be, be performed, including performance of a, of a rumenotomy to take out the offending materials. I have this usually as an exercise for, for students, so, so for veterinary, for clinical as well as pre-veterinary students, this would be a good exercise to do. Um, basically come up with uh, differential diagnosis to the problems that are identified during a physical examination. So we did mention that acute diarrhea can be uh, found in some of these cases. Uh, you can have endotoxemia or sepsis, so diseases that will present with uh, similar appearance as well would be important to consider. So things like septic mastitis, uh, metritis, or, or pneumonia. And uh, also conditions that can result in an animal being down because, because of the systemic disease, the hypovolemia that can be occurring, these animals can, can often present as uh, animals that are down a cows or recumbent. Then we were talking earlier about differentials for blood. All of those would be reasonable considerations uh, for this particular case. And most often that's just using the history um, signalment and um, this will provide just pertinent information in combination with just minimal diagnostic procedures that we will include evaluation of a rumen sample 
this is all that's required to come up with a definitive diagnosis of rumen acidosis. Okay. And one of the key things to do is to be able to analyze rumen fluids. On this slide here, I have just basic normal characteristics of, uh, of rumen fluid. And the mainly the color, but most importantly, obviously, the pH. Um, anything less than the pH of 5 or less is diagnostic of rumen acidosis. And then one of the main things that we do would be to evaluate the activity of the microorganisms in the rumen fluid, particularly the pro protozoal activity that we can evaluate under the microscope. This mention of uh, looking at uh, bacteria as well, so you can do a gram stain, uh, which in general you're supposed to see gram negative predominantly in a normal situation. But remember, we talked about Streptococcus bovis proliferating, and that is a gram-positive um, bacterium, which would be pre predominant in cases of uh, rumen acidosis early on, certainly. And then chloride concentration, this is just um, one of the characteristics of, uh, of uh, normal rumen fluid analysis. So we talked about... <clears throat> The few things that you have to do on a rumen fluid sample for purposes of diagnosing acidosis, right? A milky gray color, and usually this has got an acidic odor. So if you have smelled uh, rumen fluid before, you will know the difference. I mean, this is uh, a sort of a strong uh, smell to it, described as acidic, and obviously a pH of less than five is diagnostic. And I have a slide here. Let's see if this will play. All right, this was supposed to be a video of rosal activity, which I cannot get to play at this point. All right, well, I'll try to come back to it when I'm in the question and answer segment and see if we can, we can play it. So, certainly, if you're looking through the microscope and there's no movement like that, then we are. Then obviously, this is indicative of a, a severely a microbial uh, fermentative disorder. So in this case, coupled with a low pH, it should be pretty diagnostic. A reduction test that can be performed with methylene blue. I don't think this is commonly done in practice, but this is something that is available that can be done, and you basically monitor the reduction of methylene blue over time and uh, based on the appropriate dilutions of uh, methylene blue uh, solution, uh, basically the reduction should take no more than three to six minutes. Anything longer than six minutes is considered diagnostic of uh, at least affected by uh, microbial fermentative ac activity. So coupling that with already the low pH and affected protozoal motility should be diagnostic enough for, for rumen acidosis. Now, this does not mean to say that you can't employ other diagnostics, other ancillary diagnostics, so things like uh, blood work, CBC, uh, chemistry, venous blood gas analysis. These would be important in terms of just characterizing the severity of the disease, in particular when you're going to perform interventions that would include intravenous fluid therapy, as this would also help to guide or formulating your, your treatment uh, protocol in this case. But these are usually not required for diagnosis. Okay, that actually worked. So you can appreciate normal motility and uh, different sizes, which is you know, pleomorphism, which is uh, normal for, for rumen fluid. So what things can we do for treatment? So earlier when I talked about using a large board tube, uh, a king main tube, and this can also be used in this case, particularly important, right, if you're able to evacuate most of this fluid that is rich in lactic acid, uh, this would be indicated in this case. Certainly a ruminotomy would be the best approach because that allows you to remove even more of these offending materials. Activated charcoal has got the property of being a non-specific binder of toxins, so this can also be used um, as part of the treatment. We can use magnesium hydroxide to neutralize the acid 
uh, but this can be this needs to be used with caution and 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 in conjunction with evacuating the rumen of because you're not able to provide enough magnesium hydroxide to neutralize acid if you do not uh, begin by evacuating the the rumen contents first and if you end up doing so uh, just to watch for you know what can be overzealous use of magnesium hydroxide because you don't want the opposite effect of inducing rumen alkalosis because in itself too that that is not that is not good for the four stomachs you can also these animals will definitely benefit from transformation because you can jump start their uh, rumen microbial populations because they need to be reestablished as you can imagine uh, this already would have been affected by the by the acidity and one of the things that we know to be effective particularly in a group setting would be to provide animals with a feed uh, with a roughage sort of diet only uh, at that time because it, we know that chewing on uh, long stem roughages will induce salivation and we talked about saliva production being important for buffering capacity in the room and because saliva is rich in bicarbonate and, and phosphorus, which are important for, uh, for their buffering activity. Fluids are important as well, systemically, particularly depending on how your patient is presenting. And this is, again, like where your ancillary diagnostics are going to be very important because they will help guide in the design of fluid protocols. Because of the inflammatory of the inflammation that's associated with the conditions, it's common that you know non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are used. Uh, but I should mention that they can they need to be used with caution too, because you have an animal that is severely dehydrated. Uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are known to be associated with consequent uh, complications developing, such as abomasal ulceration, or they can result in renal renal toxicity as well so you may have an animal that presents with that with renal failure but you probably in a good situation if you're combining use of non-steroid anti-inflammatories with the intravenous fluids anyway so and as you recall if you perform ruminotomy you need to provide antibiotics and even without ruminotomy right we did talk about uh, the caustic effect of the the acidos the acidotic environment in the rumen and this can lead to development of bacteremia. So it will be critical that antibiotics be used in, this, uh, in these situations. And one of the things that happened too is because of the um, effect on the microbial populations and the protozoar, production of normal vitamins, including thiamine, uh, that should be occurring in a normal rumen is affected as well. So some of you will, will recall thiamine is very important because in deficiency cases there are conditions um, that affect the central nervous system, particularly presenting with uh, blindness. So here I'm, I'm talking about a condition known as polioencephalomalacia. So basically this becomes more preventative um, in terms of um, preventing the development of polioencephalomalacia. What can happen after or following this condition? Uh, things like chemical ruminitis, like we talked about earlier, and then you can have bacterial or, or fungal invasion of the rumen. So these are um, pathological you know, processes that occur as a consequence. And you may have this animal presenting with recurrent blood because the motility is affected due to the ruminitis. Retosis. We talked about endotoxemia. This is happening acutely, right? So you see your, your patient uh, being sick uh, because of uh, endotoxins that have been absorbed into the bloodstream. Uh, it's also been shown that uh, these animals can develop liver abscesses, and liver abscesses, as we know, these are, you know, a cause for contamination of these organs at, uh, at, at meat inspections and so forth. And rumen acidosis is one of the major causes uh, that have been implicated in terms of development of liver abscesses. You can also acute you see acute laminitis, and there's all a whole range of lameness conditions that we can see in developing in cattle uh, that can point to a case or a situation of ruminant acidosis that happened perhaps a few weeks earlier. This is especially true for cases of ruminant acidosis that are 
not presenting with acute clinical signs. So these are uh, cases of subacute ruminal acidosis. Uh, this condition is really beyond the scope of this talk, but it is something to, to keep in mind. So if you have isolated cases in a herd that are presenting with what you diagnose as clinical acidosis, it's probably imperative that you, you reach out to the remainder or the rest of the herd to make sure that there are no cases of subclinical ruminal acidosis that are occurring. Um, you may get a sense that this was actually the problem a few weeks later if you all of a sudden you end up dealing with lemnesis where you diagnose sore ulcers, foot abscesses, white line disease, or overgrown feet, which would be characteristic of a chronic laminitis. Uh, a few more um, sequelae or what follows rumen acidosis, uh, the Carvel syndrome is very well described where animals may just present with a feral case of uh, nose bleeding or epistaxis and it is thought to come from, you know, thrown by that they have established themselves within, uh, um, within the lungs and they end up forming abscesses that erode into major arteries and airways and you have massive bleeding that can occur that is usually fatal. Some cases that are not uh, as fatal, you may actually see a few animals that may present with just a little bit of nose uh, bleeding that you're able to pick up on a few animals. So that may be an indication that there might be a pro problem of rumen acidosis or even subacute ruminal acidosis going on uh, through the herd or in feedlot situations. Okay. Um, I have a little bit of information here. Like I said, um, subacute ruminal acidosis is beyond the scope of this talk, and this really uh, also is more important in terms of head level um, health evaluations of of, um, of of the large herd of the remainder of the herd in general. Uh, what I was really just focusing on was uh, rumen acidosis, particularly affecting that single uh, clinical animal that presents to you. Okay, the next case is uh, hardware disease. And if you, as you recall, we talked earlier about vagal indigestion and in both type, type 2 as well as uh, type 3, there may be damage to, or if the ventral branch of the vagus nerve, its function may be affected and you may have Type or type three vagal indigestion, and one of the major core, or one of the most commonly implicated conditions causing the, the those types of vagal indigestion is hardware disease. And so we know that in ruminants, particularly in cattle, they can ingest foreign materials, including you know sharp objects, and because of the anatomy of their tongue and the oral cavity. Usually, they do not feel these sharp, sharp objects when they accidentally ingest them. This is usually an indication that animals perhaps have a deficiency going on because they are exhibiting signs of pica. And phosphorus deficiency is one that has been identified previously, or most commonly, as a, as a reason for the pica. Okay, it is possible that metallic objects can be uh, found in chopped feeds, so it's not unusual also that, you know, animals that even are fed in well mixed rations can end up developing these conditions. And we talked earlier about, um, so when you're diagnosing hardware disease, one of the things that you'll notice that these animals are presenting for possibly having anterior abdominal pain. And one of the things that you're able to do is perform what is known as a with a pinch test, basically to check if the animal will move. The basic response is that the animals will ventral flex initially, and I'll show this on the next uh, slide. Okay. This is the basic appearance of an animal that is sort of camped under, showing signs of abdominal pain. And when you're able to examine this animal to check for pain, you can pinch the withers and look for this animal to ventral flex for the first time, but as you consecutively perform this procedure, 
the animal may be aware of presence of pain from the initial ventral flexing. So the animal probably will resist ventral flexing subsequently. Or the other thing you may be able to identify is that the animal will grunt with every uh, ventral flexion that you do because of displacement or movement of internal organs and additions that may have developed and therefore responsible for causing the pain. These animals may also present with acute uh, fever. They can present with a uh, decreased uh, appetite, decreased ruminations like we found, found earlier. Um, they can also present with decreased uh, milk production, in particular in cases of dairy cattle. And I talked about grants uh, when you perform the test for checking for cranial abdominal pain. Um, there may be decreased defecation and urination. Um, definitely, you might find signs of increased heart rate. In particular, if there's animals that have developed signs of, uh, of heart failure, and they may also present with signs of blood. And if you remember, we said that uh, hardware disease will be a, an important differential to cases of blood, particularly those that are slowly progressing uh, over time. And, and as you will see uh, in this video here, let's see, hopefully this will play. Yes, it's going to play. So one of the things we can appreciate in this video, this is a cow that actually has cardiovascular failure, and we can appreciate the how predominant the jugular vein is. Okay, and you can actually empty the jugular vein by occluding the top section here and just pushing the blood downwards, it immediately fills back up with blood again. So these are what are known as uh, jugular pulses and jugular distension. And it is uh, sort of characteristic in cases of heart failure in cattle that are clinical. Some of the clinical pathology, uh, pathology that we may be able to encounter if we utilize ancillary diagnostics in this case, which would be critical because, again, it, it is really hard to just use clinical signs alone for you to derive uh, or arrive at a diagnosis for hardware disease. So you can perform blood work. So usually a white, an increased white blood cell count, neutrophilic uh, leukocytosis usually accompanies these cases. You may find increased to, uh, total proteins, both fibrinogen and globulins. Um, some proteins that have been uh, identified and described earlier include acute phase proteins like uh, aptoglobulin. Uh, but those particular kinds of proteins are usually not commonly assessed in practice, but in, in research settings, those have been found to be increased as well in these cases. Cases of um, <clears throat> uh, serum abnormalities, they, these are fairly nonspecific. As, as you recall, I said that, you know, animals that present with general GI disease or just prolonged systemic disease in general, Cattle usually show metabolic alkalosis, uh, some level of hypochloremia and some level of hyperkalemia as well. And in cases that have um, cardiac disease that are in heart failure, you may be able to measure um, isoforms of some of these uh, of enzymes uh, that indicate elevations in cardiac enzymes. So that may uh, be useful additional information uh, to use. But by far the most important set of diagnostics that you can use in hardware disease would be imaging modalities, right? And in some in some uh, studies that have um, been shown, so using radiography, for example, this is the elbow, and we can appreciate a metallic foreign object here. Uh, so radiographs are really um, associated with you know sensitivities of upwards of 64 to about 90. 4% uh, in identifying these foreign metallic objects. But the specificity ranges from like 19 to, to 80%. So probably not too much of a, of a wide range there. Uh, you may be able to pick up some other things too. Uh, for example, you may be able to find magnets uh, in cases where there have been prophylactic administration of, of magnets. In this particular case, we do not appreciate one. So this animal was probably predisposed, predisposed to developing this condition because uh, no magnet was uh, 
was administered, which really is a very important preventative procedure that can be performed. As you probably, um, as was discussed in the last lecture, uh, ultrasound would be very useful in this particular case. Usually you can appreciate abnormally looking fluid around the reticulum. Uh, so this is where you can appreciate the abdominal effusion associated with peritonitis. You can also appreciate in some cases um, pleural effusion too that may be associated with, with, uh, with this condition. As you can imagine, usually uh, this metallic foreign object is associated with perforating into the abdomen, but also through the diaphragm into the thoracic cavity and the pericardium as well. So in terms of treatment, I have to say that in general, these cases do not respond very well to treatment. Their response to treatment is pretty poor, but nevertheless it's attempted, particularly in valuable animals. So one of the things that can be done is uh, administer a magnet. Uh, it's a little bit late at this point. Um, it's debatable as to whether the magnet is actually able to pull the sharp metallic object that is already uh, perforated. In any case, the metallic object has already seeded the infection. So maybe, maybe too late, but nevertheless, it's something important to do. Uh, use of antibiotics uh, can, be, can be used as well um, as oral fluids and electrolytes is needed, especially if you have used your ancillary um, diagnostics to define what electrolyte imbalances may be occurring. Definitely pain medication and controlling inflammation using non-steroidal anti-inflammatories will be important. In some cases, ruminotomy can be performed. Um, and there's one study out there that uh, that reported some really good or high, um, you know, good prognosis. But by and large, this is a, a disease that is associated with, with poor responses to treatment, regardless of, of what you do. Um, if you're able to perform surgery and are able to diagnose this condition early on, uh, those cases may be the ones that benefit the most and the best and may carry the best prognosis. Um, but you can appreciate down here in this picture, this is an animal that was euthanized following uh, traumatic reticular peri pericarditis in this case. Here is the heart and here are the lungs in and you can appreciate the pericardium, how large it is, and the amount of fluid within the pericardium. And obviously, uh, was the reason for this animal presenting in, uh, in heart failure. So really, I mean, it's hard to control such an advanced uh, pathological process in this case. That's, this is why these cases don't respond very well to, to treatments. And so it is important that um, we focus more on controlling or doing those uh, procedures that will reduce the chances or the likelihood of this condition happening. A long time ago, we used to associate this condition, right, with the pastures that look like this, where foreign uh, metallic objects are dumped on pasture and somehow animals get access to, and this is where they pick up the, the materials. But we know that even with... Uh, um, current systems in which we mix uh, total mixed rations, it is possible that within these chopped feeds, there might be these metallic foreign, foreign objects. So it's important to provide or have magnets that are also included within this mixing uh, process so that they can trap these foreign, metab um, uh, foreign metallic um, objects as they go through the mixing process. But at the level of the cow, one of the most important things that should be done is to administer a magnet. So these are just a, a collection of magnets that were collected um, at slaughter. Okay, animals that did not have clinical disease um, of hardware because they had, you know, magnets that were doing their job efficiently. So that's a lot of nails there. So what can happen in uh, in hardware is uh, is a circular. So you can have development of peritonitis uh, with septic pericarditis and result in heart failure or reticular abscessation and then vagal indigestion. And then you have an animal that present with progressive distension or recurrent uh, situations of blood that you have to deal with 
uh, over and over again. And I can't emphasize this enough. Uh, prevention seems to be really hinged upon making sure that you perform procedures that reduce chances of metallic objects uh, causing perforation. So administration of magnets is really essential. All right, so that does it for uh, hardware disease. The next condition that we'll talk about is abomasal displacement. And in abomasal displacement, <clears throat> generally this condition is considered to be multifactorial, uh, mostly affecting dairy cattle. It's not unheard of in beef, but usually this happens in, in very rare of occasions. And in dairy, in particular, it's associated with high producing uh, dairy cows. And most of the time, this condition occurs after calving, maybe two to three weeks post calving. However, I have to mention that it's not unusual that you can see cases of uh, displaced abomasum in lead lactation or even in dry cattle. Um, usually animals in, confi in confinement facilities and like I said, you may find this condition in calves. In fact, there's a clinical case series that's reported out there where displaced abomasum occurred in calves. It's also possible that you may see this condition in small ruminants, but uh, again, quite rarely. How this develops is generally thought to be a combination of two main things. So there has to be decreased motility of the abomasum. And this can occur secondary to conditions such as uh, hypocalcemia or ketosis. And then secondly, there has to be production of gas within the abomasum. And this can result in a buoyancy-like effect with the abomasum because of the gas that is accumulated is going to rise uh, and then be displaced either to the left or to the right. Uh, it also helps that in cases where the rumen can be sub-optimally filled, so if an animal has been off feed for a long time, that can create that potential space on the left side and uh, provide opportunities for displacement to the left. Uh, this can also be the reason why most cows soon after calving can be pre predisposed to displacement because you can imagine um, a large potential space that gets created soon after calving and, and so possibly an animal in the right circumstances can develop uh, abomasal displacement. Right, here's just a schematic of uh, left-sided displacement. If we were visualizing the animal from the back, this is the left side and here's the abomasum. We have slow distension and progressive uh, movement of the abomasum to the left side. This can, you, most of the time in terms of predisposition in terms of how the abomasum is still laid out within the abdomen, you still have the cranial portion of the, abdo of the abdomasum in the cranial side and the caudal portion or the pyloric side still on the aborid side. So there's sort of a pile, uh, partial obstruction to flow. Okay, still material can flow through uh, because this does not result in complete obstruction. So that is why in cases of left, left displacement of the abomasum, these are not real emergencies. And so any surgical approaches to fix this can be often be delayed to the next day. Um, contrary to right displacement of the abomasum, in which generally you have distension and then the abomasum rises uh, on that right side. It can be a simple displacement and distension, but it can also be a severe condition in which the displacement and distension is associated with a twist or a volvulus. And this volvulus is potentially uh, a life, it is a life threatening condition that requires treatment or emergency treatment right away. So because of this, these cases usually require that surgery be performed as soon as possible. Okay, uh, here's just a little bit more information. Usually, like I said, a recently fresh animal that is gradually declining in terms of milk production. There's uh, 
information that the animal now prefers to just eat forages, just the hay, and won't eat co uh, concentrates. And then you have just this drastic reduction in milk production. So it can have as much as like 50 kilogram uh, production per day going down to less than 10 kilograms. Or if we are talking about pounds, you know, drastic change from like 80 pounds, for example, to about 10, 15 pounds a day. So that'll be significant. Uh, some of the clinical signs that you find, so that the characteristic ping and splash that you are able to elicit is you're auscultating the, um, on the on the side of albumesal displacement. And the ping and splash are really, really characteristic in albumesal displacement. You can have a very high degree of confidence of diagnosing this condition uh, just by, by physical findings alone. Something described as a sprung rib, basically where the albumesum has uh, displaced the rumen medially and it's pushing the 13th rib outward a little bit. So this is from a dorsal view of the animal. And most of the time, uh, displacement to the left is associated with other concurrent uh, clinical conditions. So things like retained fetal membranes, uh, metritis, hypocalcemia, ketosis, um, mastitis, fatty liver, and, and abomeso ulcers. So in general, most of those conditions that we expect to see commonly here uh, postpartum in a dairy cow, these tend to be associated with left displacement of the abomesum. Again, not necessary, but if you are able to perform ancillary diagnostics, again, to sort of characterize just the degree or the severity of, uh, of disease in this case and perhaps guide your treatment approach. If you're able to perform a serum biochemistry, you're going to pick up metabolic alkalosis uh, with hypochloremia and hypokalemia. And like I said earlier on, again, this tends to be just a general finding sometimes, but where clinical signs are fitting, this would be additional uh, findings to support your diagnosis of uh, displaced abomesum. Ketosis is usually present, and uh, some cows you can diagnose ketosis uh, for days before you can pick up a displacement of the abomesum. So this is where the question comes up with what whether ketosis is the cause of the displacement of the abomesum or it's a consequence. I think that is that is uh, quite debatable. Either way, I think it's a uh, you probably are going to be correct as long as you can uh, you can uh, you can support it. Uh, decrease in calcium. Remember, like I said, hypocalcemia may be associated with this, and this is basically due to decreased intake <clears throat> and decreased absorption. And then there could be some other things too that may be concurrent with abomesal displacement. So there may be abomesal ulcers, or there can be some other secondary conditions as well. Now, a good uh, exercise here would be to think about what other things could ping uh, and, and uh, possibly splash on the same spots or same areas that we diagnose a displacement of the abomesum. So on looking on the left side here, it's possible that you can um, pick up just a rumen gas <coughs> cap, which is here in the green, or pneumoperitoneum, which basically is going to ping on, the, on both sides of the abdomen. Uh, and obviously, this is the, the red line is showing you the common place for diagnosing and, and displacement of the abomesum. And then I should just caution you that, you know, when, whereas most cases, almost like 85, 90% of the time, this is where you will find the abomesum. If displaced to the left, it is also possible that it may be lower, a little bit off or out of the common area that we find it. So you may be dealing with a case of low displacement of the abomesum. So it's important to ping and splash wider than just this area depicted by the red circle. Okay. And here are some other dis differentials to consider. So things like air in the uterus or physometra or <clears throat> cecal distension and dislocation, particularly in cases of uh, displacement on the, on the right side. Okay. Um, the most common case would be the displacement to the left. So for every 10 or so cases that you see, you may be able to see one, a single case of uh, right-sided uh, displacement. The clinical appearance is basically the same, except 
the, ca the clinical appearance is worse with displacement to the right because there may be involvement of, uh, of a torsion or the twist. Again, here are some of the some more differentials that you need to consider. In terms of visualization, I have this diagram here to just help think about what's happening in the case of a volvulus. Okay, this and this would be important in terms of correcting this uh, the occurrence of this twist. So this diagram here is showing them what is normal. So here's the rumen. And the abomasum here is in purple, and just take note of where the P indicating the pylorus and the D is the beginning of the small intestine, so the duodenum. And you have distension, and then the twist is basically counterclockwise. And uh, you know, it may be difficult to appreciate in this schematic, but ultimately, when the twist has occurred, the pylorus is on the cranial side, so it's no longer on the back like it is here on the normal picture. So, this is where. Uh, when you explore upon performing a, uh, an abdominal approach to perform the surgical correction, you're feeling for uh, presence of the pylorus on the, on the cranial side. And then if there's a description of, uh, you know, bands of part of the momentum, how they become stretched, this can become really tricky in uh, identifying if you haven't worked on, on many of these cases. But the key thing to just remember is the normal anatomy is such that when you're able to perform a count a clockwise manipulation of the twist and um, replace the abomasum in its normal anatomical position, you should be able to appreciate uh, the normal positioning of the pylorus and the duodenum. And this this can really become dramatic, particularly distension of of the duodenum with the gas. So it should be very clear to see once you are able to correct this uh, this volvulus. Like I said, most of these cases are associated with hypovolemia and dehydration, and they have the most significant acid base and electrolyte disturbances uh, when you compare with cases of left, displace left displacement alone. Okay. And some of the clinical signs that you will see uh, would be hypovolemia, uh, heart rate of greater than 100 beats per minute, and this is usually due to pain. You can have complete ruminal stasis, and you should think of blood as a differential in this case. Um, bilateral abdominal distension, and then scant or absent uh, fecal material. I also have to mention that some of these cases may present with presence of diarrhea, which is basically kind of a paradox in this case because you're expecting these animals to ex be experiencing some partial obstruction in the left displacement or complete volvulus. But fluid is able to seep through and you're able to see the uh, presence of diarrhea in some cases. Reca recumbence usually develops, particularly in cases of uh, right displacement of the abomasum, or in situations where left displacement of the abomasum has been misdiagnosed and has been uh, long-standing, you, know, you know, for a while. Differentials would be um, proximal intestinal obstruction or torsion, torsion of the rumen of the root of the mesentery, just because of how painful uh, this condition becomes and the distension that occurs. And then just think of the differential to differentials to the right displacement of the of the abomasum as well. Okay, if you, again, if you perform ancillary diagnostics, which are not required, these are some of the findings that you get. The metabolic alkalosis, hypo, hypochloremia, and hyperkalemia, and there's something called paradoxic aciduria. So if you perform the urinalysis, and the, best, the paradox is basically the fact that these animals have profound metabolic alkalosis, yet the urine presents with some uh, aciduria or some acidic pH, right? So just to get, to get an appreciation of how this hypochloremia develops, this is again, what is expected to be normal. Uh, the rumen reticulum presented in green, that's omesum and that's the abomesum. 
under normal circumstances, we have a secretion of chloride of chloride when the hydrochloric acid is produced in the abomasum, and there should be you know easy passage into the small intestines and to the duodenum, or well, which would be the site of absorption for chloride, and so this allows the recirculation of uh, of chloride. But when there is volvula, so and there's an obst obstruction over here, and then it's just important for me to to point out that in this schematic, I don't show any volvulus, but this red X here is just representing in cases where there's obstruction, in, including volvulus. Then you don't have chloride traveling down or moving to the duodenum to be absorbed. And so that will result in decrease in, in serum chloride, so hence a hypochloremia. And then you can have accumulation or sequestration of the chloride in the abomasum, and that can eventually result in uh, internal vomiting, or as we have discussed in earlier on in type 3 vagal indigestion. Um, and so this is the reason why uh, you're able to identify increased levels of chloride in vagal indigestion. You probably are not going to be measuring vomiting chloride in a case of right displacement of the abomasum, right? Because you have this is a fairly acute condition. You have other indicators of disease that, that you're relying on, and, and you basically go with those. The hypochloremia can be explained by decreased intake and some of the electrolyte shifts that occur through, throughout within the body as well. Um, just a little explanation of, on that paradoxic aciduria. If you think of, about it, if there is systemic alkalosis, you would think that uh, some metabolic alk acidosis should be there to compensate for the developing alkalosis, right? Which suggests that hydrogen, hydrogen ions need to be retained for that purpose, okay? But <clears throat> the animal will prioritize retention of sodium because these animals are presenting with severe dehydration and hypovolemia. So in, in order to maintain blood volume, sodium needs to be retained, right? But we said these animals are also hypochloremic. And we know that to maintain electroneutrality, chloride is usually retained together with sodium, okay? But we don't have the chloride any much, right, because of the hypochloremia. And so instead, the animal will try to excrete excess cations, right, positively charged ions. And sodium is not really an option here, and this is really overly simplifying it. Sodium is an option because we need it to maintain blood volume, and so the option then becomes secretion of potassium, even in the face of hypochloremia, okay? Um, but the potassium is not available, right, because we have hypokalemia. And so the excess acid is then secreted in this case. This is the reason why we see the aciduria uh, and then the paradox uh, develops. And it's important to, to note that eventually cases that are long-standing that have not been corrected can develop systemic acidosis. Uh, because of uh, systemic lactic acid production, particularly coming from the abomasal wall. And this is uh, a bad prognostic indicator. And so if you go through here, some of the top points I have, uh, serum concentration of chloride less than 80 uh, associated with a poor prognosis. If you were able to perform a venous blood gas analysis, you know, been found acidosis, this is also indicative of a poor prognosis. Usually, these animals are metabolically alkalotic. Um, if you open the, abomes, the abdomen during surgery and find a purple-looking abomasal wall, again, this is associated with poor prognosis. After a correction of the abomasal displacement, if there's occurrence of diarrhea, this is a good sign because that shows that there's been establishment of, you have corrected the obstruction and perhaps GI motility has been restored and we are able to see, <clears throat> uh, you know, diarrhea occurring as a good prognostic sign. And usually this does not last for more than 24 hours. 
Complications that can develop would be ischemia of the abomasum. Uh, long term, uh, this may damage contractility of the abomasum, and that may result in pyloric outflow or uh, problems, and that can result in vagal indigestion. These animals may present much later for that problem, as we had discussed earlier. You can also have occurrence of peritonitis. As you can imagine, if the wall of the abomasum has been weakened, there may be leakage or seepage of uh, of material into the abdomen. The most dramatic of the condi of this condition, again, like I said, the abomasal volvulus, and so you need to perform immediate surgery. And success rates are, you know, upwards of 61 to about 86 percent, so pretty good. And especially when coupled with correction of acid base um, electrolyte deficits that you have identified on serum chemistry or venous blood gases. And then obviously need to include prophylactic antibiotics um, in general because of the surgery, but also because the abomasal war is compromised in this case too, and the integrity may be questionable. non steroid are anti-inflammatories, and later on you can use, utilize transformations as well to help with contractions of the four stomachs. Uh, there are some cases that have been shown to benefit from the use of prokinetic drugs, um, this may be difficult to show really, um, you know, their benefit. Like in cases where you don't have them, it doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to compromise the prognosis. But certainly in most cases, it, certainly in my experience, uh, some prokinetic drugs tend to be just included uh, of the expectation that motility is severely affected in cases of abomas or volvulus. A good exercise for for generally most of us, right, is to think about what sort of uh, pings can be considered differentials. I know I mentioned this earlier, but these diagrams help to show exactly, you know, where some of these can be can be identified. So this would be an abomasal ping, and on the right side, another abomasal ping. This is a general area to to find it, and then if it's on the Right side, you can you're thinking of um, pneumoperitoneum ping, and just remember that this will also ping on the left side as well sometimes. And in this case, it's a small area that's affected. Usually, this is the spiral colon. It's uh, associated with really high up on that 13th, 13th rib and a little bit in the cranial portion of the paralumbar fossa. In terms of uh, correction. Uh, there are different techniques that are available. Okay, there are two major categories. So you can have invasive techniques and then minimally invasive techniques. And I'm just providing the overview here. I'm not going to go through the specifics of um, the surgical correction itself, although I do have slides on this PowerPoint that uh, that are associated with this talk, so I can provide this later for for you know for individual review. But invasive techniques would be anything where you have to perform a surgery or penetration of the abdominal cavity. Okay, so a right-sided approach and a fixation of the abomasum via an omentopexy or performance of an, a pyloropexy or a combination of these two, a pyloromentopexy. And then on the left side, left side flank, uh, left flank abomasopexy. And this approach should only be used for a left-sided displacement of abomasum. It just makes sense that that's the only way you're going to be able to visualize displacement to the left and, and it doesn't work for, for the right side. And then you can perform right paramedian abomasopexy. Uh, so with the animal lying in, dos in dorsal recumbency, and this is thought to be probably the gold standard procedure because it sort of replaces the abomasum right uh, by its anatomical position naturally. Then minimally invasive techniques would be things that you don't have to do uh, major surgical uh, exploration. So things like uh, just a regular rolling or roll and tack, which is basically suturing uh, with a large needle across the body wall and suturing the, the abomasum to to the body wall. Or you can perform a roll and toggle, which is basically just a 
the offensive version of a roll and tack. And then there are laparoscopic techniques that are used. Um, I have no experience with laparoscopic fixation of the abomasoid displacement. So um, I won't go much into that. But these are available for those that um, have developed that expertise. Okay, so in terms of how do you decide what approach to use for managing displacement of the abomasum? Um, well, the first thing is, <clears throat> this is a question I always give just to reinforce the point that almost always, always you have to surgically correct right displacement of the abomasum, right? Because of the inherent difficulty of distinguishing between just simple displacement and distension uh, versus presence of a torsion or twist. So it is imperative that you perform a surgical exploration uh, and perform surgical fixation of the right displacement uh, this way. Uh, you know, one approach to decide on which animals to perform surgery or not can depend on their level of production. So those animals that are on the upper 25% of production can probably undergo surgery because this is significantly more cost compared to some of the other approaches. So animals that rank in the middle, like 50% of production can undergo just a roll and tack or toggle. And lower 25%, perhaps it's time for those animals to leave the herd or to be culled. There are other, other, point, other factors that may need to be considered too, right? If uh, head size, for example, uh, your client may be more willing to cull in larger herds uh, in, low, in smaller herds, they may want to perform a specific fixation. You may end up having to perform surgery regardless of production level. Um, incidence rate, uh, definitely, if you are seeing a lot of displacement of abomasum, it may not be practical to be performing a lot of surgeries because then it doesn't become economically feasible for the client. And finally, comfort of the veterinarian. In general, displacement of the abomasum surgery, this is just basic surgery for food animal veterinarians in general, so this should not be really a problem. It may become a case where you have a very large cow or a cow that is in late pregnancy that the approach may be a little bit challenging uh, in terms of the proper surgical approach that needs to be performed. Prevention is important, so definitely you have to review those predisposing factors, including reviewing uh, ration, um, concurrent diseases. Remember I mentioned the several diseases that tend to be uh, uh, associated with displacement of the abomasum, particularly to the left. To the left, and then you know reviewing and and uh, and uh, making any changes to ensure cow comfort. This is a Vague, very like a um, broad recommendation here, but uh, uh, many, many, many things that can be performed, including uh, making sure that free stores are comfortable, uh, they, you know, so housing, access to water, and just uh, improving cow comfort can reduce the incidence or the occurrence of abomasal displacement. All right, so the remainder of the Slides really basically talk about surgical approach to the abomasum, um, but I'm not really going to to focus on this at this point. Um, we, we can go to some of these slides if they become a topic of, uh, of question or discussion from the audience. And so I have a series of slides here, which I am just going to skip and go to the very end. All right, so that concludes this presentation at this point. Um, I will hand it over back to, to the moderator or panelists and how we're going to address questions from the audience. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Thank Dr. Vicky. Uh, 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 continuous lecture continuous of more than one hour, hour 50 minutes. minutes. And we are, the, yeah. we are the, uh, taking up the questions. With the permission of the Dr. Permission Venke, of Dr. Venke we'll, uh, we require uh, just two minutes, minutes to gather to the gather. questions. Dr. Sandhus, can you put a filler? 
Sir, I will put, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. We will come back to you, sir, after two minutes. Okay. Really, yeah. Should I stop sharing my... Yeah, please stop sharing your PowerPoint. Okay. We will come back to you after two minutes. And then, meanwhile, we are gathering the questions put up by the participants. Okay. Thank you. Dr. Sandosh, please put on filler. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Santosh. Uh, Dr. Wengi, we have really enjoyed your class. And uh, there was an exhaustive discussion on disorders of forced stomach. Uh, and uh, there were many important practical tips for the students to remember important points, like prognostic indicators and putting on the sequence of abomasal valves. We really enjoyed and very informative. Thank you very much. And sure. there are uh, uh, about uh, 222 questions. Uh, and we have cut short to uh, eight questions because many of the questions we have got answers in your uh, PowerPoint. So we'll go for the questions now. Okay. Uh, uh, what are the dose of uh, paloxiline uh, if it is used? And what is the route? Okay, so paloxylin is, um, so basically it's, it comes packaged in, it's, it's uh, volume-wise, it's 60 ml, and the route of administration is orally, and the, and the dose is 60 ml. Now, okay. I know this, this is not as, concentration-wise, um, okay. I have to look at look at that, but basically it's about yeah. Okay, thank you. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Is there any specific clinical signs for uh, pyloric outflow obstructions? Could you repeat the question again, please? Uh, do we have any specific clinical sign for uh, pyloric outflow obstruction? So, like I said specific probably not in the sense that is going to be 
pathognomonic or diagnostic in any way, but uh, pyloric outflow obstruction would result in distension of the abomasum, and then you have backflow into the rumen. And so generally what you have is distension of the dorsal sac and the ventral sac of the, album, of the rumen. And so what you have is that purple appearance that I was describing. So when you're viewing the animal from the back, you have distension high on the left and lower ventrally on the right. So clinically, that's what you see. And you're considering blood as well as your differentials. And this is where those ancillary diagnostics are going to be critical uh, for to aid in the diagnosis. So measuring the rumen chloride would be important. So pyloric outflow obstruction, you expect internal vomiting. And so the rumen chloride concentrations should be elevated in that case. Thank you. So we'll do follow this estimation of chloride from now onwards. Uh, uh, during the mention, you have uh, told about transformation. So can we use uh, right. stored, uh, uh, stored rumen fluid? If so, for how many days we can use? Well, so that is a, a tricky one. So I, I would say that, um, so I can't give a blanket recommendation for how long you can store. In my experience, uh, transfonet that you are able to cover with mineral oil on top to mend that, that anaerobiasis, right? and stored in a fridge. It's probably good for 24 hours. But if you're going to do a transfonet, whether it's fresh or stored, one of the main things you have to do is to do a microscopic, microscopic evaluation, which should tell you right away if there's no microbial activity, then probably your transfonet is not any good anymore. So if you didn't have the ability to do a microscopic evaluation, I'd probably not... I would make sure that I use mineral oil on top of the transfonet, but not keep it for more than 24 hours. Yeah, that's a nice tip. Dr. Vandi, will you please tell uh, what is the choice of fluid for a correction of metabolic alkalosis? The choice of fluid for metabolic alkalosis? So in general, uh, all you want to use would be balanced electrolyte solutions. At this point, it's just mostly a matter of volume uh, that, that is really required to restore the electrolyte deficits in general. So that's, they, they can be, you don't necessarily, so you could suggest, you could think of normal saline, for example. Normal saline is ideally thought to be minimally acidifying, right? So that could be, uh, uh, theoretically theoretically speaking, that would be your the most ideal choice of fluid. But your balanced electrolyte solutions should also achieve the job. It's a Thank volume you. issue. Yeah. Yes. Would you please tell uh, which prokinetic drug is useful uh, for uh, the above muscle involvement? <laughs> so that's a, a, a great question. So, um, again, this, uh, if you go back in literature, there, there is some literature that talks about abomeso prokinetic drugs uh, to improve abomeso emptying. So this research was mostly done in calves. Um, Constable would be the name. But anyway, so two would come to mind. So there's pro Chloramide would be one prokinetic to, drug to use, but you know I, I think it's hard to to show efficacy in a case of right displacement of the abomasum, because if in the cases without it, they still I think in my opinion will still do okay. Now another drug that has been also used before is lidocaine, so you can combine uh, infusion. A continuous rate infusion with lidocaine. So you combine that with your fluids, and that is thought to be prokinetic as well. But if you look at recent research, it's not quite prokinetic. I don't think they've really shown that. But it's it's got some other properties that help. But I think the the biggest reason why it's usually used is this idea that it's got some prokinetic um, prokinetic effects. I don't think that has been well assessed in sick animals where 
they have demonstrated its beneficial effects. But those are the two that would come to mind that may be used in uh, in cases of uh, abomesophobia. Okay. But they have to be combined. You're managing motility after you've surgically corrected the displacement. So it's, it's in combination. Okay, nice. So CRA of uh, lidocaine as you do it in equines. Thank you. Sir, so uh, you are recommending abomesopexy. So one small doubt, will it not go for addition and then the later on interfere with the motility? Could you, could you repeat that, please? Yeah. So abomesopexy is uh, uh, one of the techniques so right. to prevent, yes, yeah, so that you have recommended. So what is our uh, doubt? Will it not go for addition, thereby interfering with the motility? Uh, so, abomesopex, so in general, this procedure works very well. Uh, in general, I think most, most animals recover well. In fact, uh, there was research that followed up cases that had experienced abomesopex surgery to look at whether the pexy was still there. And I think after 12 months or so, the pexy could no longer be identified. It would be rare that this is associated with any any adhesions and affect any motility, but in isolated cases, particularly those that are fixed with a pyloropexy, chances are there that you can induce uh, outflow obstruction, so therefore affect motility. But I have to say the vast majority of cases fixed with an abomesopexy do not develop those, con those uh, um, side effects or complications of mo affected motility. Thank you. We'll take up the last question, sir. What antibiotic you will recommend for acidosis? For and, what? Uh, for acidosis? Well, so 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 in terms of acidosis, the main things to think about would be the possibility of if you think about the rumen compartment, it's just a mix of uh, of uh, bacteria in there. So in general, it has to be your broad spectrum antibiotics, particularly uh, against anaerobes. And so beta lactamases would be good choices. So penicillin uh, or penicillin type products. So you can have uh, oxytetracycline. They, in general though, these are antibiotics that are associated with long withholds for milk and meat. But again, Animals experiencing acidosis may be so severely sick, animals probably are going to die anyway. So I think uh, they require, you know, perhaps the best care that you can. So I think in that case, uh, absolute, uh, antibiotics are absolutely necessary in that case. So any broad spectrum antibiotics, but beta lactamases and, and oxytetracyclines, in my mind, uh, would be ideal choices. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wangai. So uh, I should uh, doubly thank because Dr. Wangai has readily accepted when I approached him to present a webinars for the benefit of the students and the practitioners. So thank you again, again sir. And uh, you have had a great uh, discussion on the subject proper and many of the questions raised by the, the students and the field practitioners or been uh, patiently explained by the international expert. So may I request on behalf of the organizing committee uh, to Dr. Wange, uh, um, because of the COVID, we are not able to do this. Now, if a situation arises, we may organize uh, another webinar or something like that. So we request again uh, uh, Dr. Wange to uh, deliver the lecture or participate in our webinar. Sure, absolutely. Yes, I'll be interested in doing that. Thank you very much, yeah. Thank you. So on behalf of organizing committee, may I request uh, Dr. Vishnu Guru Brun for the vote of thanks, please. Dr. Vishnu. Uh, yes, sir. Uh, good evening to one and all. So it's a great honor and privilege to propose a vote of thanks and acknowledge the contribution of each and everyone for the successful conduct of Global Biotic Medicine Webinar Series 2020 organized by Veterinary Clinical Complex, Director of Phoenix, Veterinary College and Research Institute, Terminal Valley, Canada. First and foremost, on behalf of the Organizing Committee, uh, Committee, I express my profound gratitude to our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. C. Palachandran, sir, for permitting us to organize the webinar. 
I wholeheartedly express, expressing my sincere thanks to our director of clinics, Dr. S. Balasubramaniam sir, for constant encouragement and critical advice for conducting the webinar in a grand manner. I am very happy to express my thankfulness to Dr. Vangai Mamangira, Law Journal of Clinical Sciences, College of Veterinary Medicine, Michigan State University, USA, for sharing his knowledge and experience on post of diseases in cattle and its diagnosis and clinical management. I extend my sincere thanks to deans of Constitution Colleges and University Offices of Tanawas for the support rendered for the successful conduct of the webinar. I extend my heartful thanks to Dean Madras Veterinary College and Dean Basic Sciences for providing the conference call and deputing faculties and staff to conduct the webinar in a pleasant day. I would like to extend my sincere thanks and gratitude to our organizing secretary, Dr. R. Ram Prabhu, Professor and Head Veterinary Clinical Complex, Veterinary College of Research Institute, Tinal Valley, and co organizing secretary, Dr. G. Vijay Kumar, Professor and Head Veterinary University Peripheral Hospital, Chennai, for the meticulous planning for this webinar and came out with great success. I am also exp expressing my sincere thanks to Mr. Karunanadi, Vice President, Alambic Pharma, and Dr. Sandor Sinde, Alambic Pharma, our information technology partners, for their immense support by providing the digital platform for the conduct of webinar in an uninterrupted way using Microsoft Team. I, I like to extend my thanks to HOD, Department of Veterinary Animal Husbandry and Extension, Madras Veterinary College, for providing audio visual aids for this webinar. Teamwork made the webinar a great success. In the same way, I sincerely thank the effort of all the committee members, moderators, and technical staff who work as a team and lead the webinar in a successful manner. Finally, I thank the participants from all over the world and larger level practitioners, faculty members of Tanwas and other commercial colleges, and my dear students for seeking the key interest in this event, which based the webinar at grand success. Thank you. Have a nice day.